my need to continue and answer the question of who the first human is once and for all feels like a base need to me now and I can't begin to start with Delta and stuff before I answer this important question once and for all in Undertale. As discussed, we know that you have a possibly flower-based beginning as a vessel, but in order to truly understand you, I think we need to delve into the nitty-gritty. So let's start by explaining what a soul is. A soul, broadly as defined by me, is at the centre of every living creature. Literally, a living creature, also defined by me, is a body or vessel that is animated by a soul's determination. Determination is the animating force behind all action taken by a living creature and what can be described as their will to live, literally, a force that makes them live their own life. The soul informs the determination within it with personality and direction, as the soul is described as the culmination of a creature's being, and thus the living creature now begins to ambulate towards an objective rather than just aimlessly existing. As we know, a soul contains a living creature's personality, hopes, and dreams, as when Azrael died his dust, basically his body that as a monster has been symbiotically infused with his soul's essence spread over the flowers in Asgore's garden. Once injected with determination, one of those flowers came to life, with all of Azrael's memories and personalities, hence flowery. Now, obviously a soul does not have to be present for a creature to have a soul's determination within them and classed as a living creature. I'm clearly talking about flowery and possibly goners here, but crazy determination determination experiments aside, most living creatures require the symbiosis of body and soul to live. There seem to be two types of souls. Human souls that have heightened amounts of determination and or soul power within them which allows for them to reside outside of the body after death, and a monster soul which has much less determination than the humans and it perishes after death. Death is defined here as the destruction or removal of living functions provided by the vessel. Basically, kill the body and the soul is left on its own. Human souls are right side up and come in a variety of different colours, while monster souls are white and upside down. As for the aforementioned body, I would describe it as any vessel that allows the soul to have a physical presence. The vessel, which without a soul would be a clump of physicality, now becomes a living creature. There is a difference between monster and human bodies though, being that humans with their superior physicality have a less of a symbiotic relationship with their soul and more of a transactional one, where one can exist without the other, but they join forces to become something more able. A monster soul, being weaker in determination and the body of scarce matter, cannot ambiently exist without one another however. A human soul's heightened amount of determination may be because of this more powerful physical form, requiring more power to ambulate the body and cause it to action. In contrast, a monster's form is less of a physical one and so therefore may not need as much determination to ambulate. Their form is an outer physical facade that is then filled in with magic, making them far weaker physically but more powerful magicians. When a monster body dies, it turns to dust and their soul is destroyed, whereas a human's body simply stops working and their soul presumably survives outside of their body, where it then... <laughs> This difference in physical makeup affects how humans and monsters eat food as well. According to the food monster at Grillby's, human food, assumedly made out of physical matter, spoils and requires digestion, while monster food is immediately transformed into energy, which insinuates that it has a magical nature. I bring this up only to reinforce the idea that a human body is more of a physical machine and a monster body is more conceptual and fluid. Now, let's discuss how I believe our human body works. If a human body can live without a soul, then we must assume that it's its own living creature. That living creature has no personality though, and as such requires a soul to give it drive and passion. In our case, the human body is made up of a soul that we control, so we already see firsthand how a soul can manipulate the body to do things. But in regards to the human body being a living creature, this implies the presence of a brain or some kind of processing mechanism for the body, and therefore something the soul can use to view and understand the world on a physical level. So in a diagram, we the player send commands via the soul or control said soul directly and send commands that way. That soul, if not controlled directly, responds to our direction and sends commands to the body giving it an order to follow. If we decide to interact with an object or an entity for example, the body would relay the information it can gather from its own knowledge and the surroundings and then describe the entity or object back to us. In my opinion, that information relayed back to the soul is shown via the text box. So what are we? We are a soul that powers a human flower child as a meat mech through the underground. This can be seen when we enter a battle. We see that upon entering a battle, we retain control over the soul and enter into what I believe to be a first person view of the body. 
This is proven not only by the front-facing perspective of every monster we see during fights, but also during an attack, when the precision elements of when to strike are represented as a quick time event over an eyeball, assumedly the body's eyeball. We are looking out of the body's eyes. As we know, the soul decides what to do and then orders the body to act on its decisions. This happens with all options that can be taken within the battle menu, as our soul is the selection marker for all of them. But what is this text box really? Well, let's view it from the perspective of a soul, which technically we are. It's something that relays information to us, the soul, whether that be a description of an object or a person showing a speech that is currently happening between us or anything else that might be pertinent at the time. However, during genocide, we do get some hints as to something else that this text box is. You see, the text box isn't relaying information to us as an unbiased observer. It's relaying what the body thinks of the situation to us, the soul, as the body understands it. To the ends, the body deems necessary. Remember, the body is its own living being and during genocide, as it gains more and more independence from the soul, it starts to not only act on its own, but it starts describing things as it sees them, regardless of our knowledge or intent for them. For example, the final mirror. During pacifist and neutral route, it states, despite everything, it's still you, hinting at the body's subservient nature and or our soul's dominance over them in terms of action. Basically, the it's still you here can be interpreted as the body relaying to us that we, the soul, are the one that's in over or control, the protagonist. However, during genocide, the mirror reads, it's me, character name. This implies that the body not only believes itself to be the first human, but also views itself as the protagonist and the one in overall control. Here in this situation, the body no longer views itself as a vessel for the soul, but rather its own person, which again makes sense as up until this point, we've been making it obsessed with determination and power during the genocide route. This change from subservient vessel to its own person is reflected in how it views its actions as well. It no longer always views its actions as something that is designed to assist us, the soul, but rather its actions are something that are its own and done for its own benefit, separate from us. While it continues to obey us at this point of the game, it doesn't always describe things in the most helpful manner, less descriptive and more of its own internal monologue to itself. This can be seen almost everywhere in Asgore's house. For example, it describes the note on the kitchen counter as something it's already read, rather than the note's contents itself. As an aside, being that Asgore hasn't been home to remove this note since the first human fell down, means he hasn't come back to this house since his kids died, or at least back to the kitchen. This is also seen when discussing the calendar in the hallway. It doesn't describe what the calendar is or any outstanding features, but only matters pertinent to the body. In this instance, the date they came to the underground. The text box has turned from something that was used for the player to interact with and understand the world around them via the body's perception, and is now the first humans in a monologue to a great degree. This shows us that the text box, and the red text that sometimes is contained within it, is the body's own thoughts, it's my belief that the red text reflects the body talking to itself versus the regular white text, which reflects the body talking to us, the soul. The circumstances have changed the body's relationship towards the soul, being one of subservience and dutifulness, to one of rebellion and self-serving. This again makes sense as we've been showing the body all the way up to this point during genocide or out that power is all that matters, and how can you be powerful if you have to take orders from something else? Why is the body gaining independence? Well, here's the scary thing. The body has always been independent all the way through the game in every route. What made us think we were in charge of anything? It's only in genocide that the body was taught to become all powerful. And as stated previously, you can't be all powerful if you still need to obey someone. We see how far the body is willing to go after genocide when we are talking to assumedly the first human in the void of destruction that is left behind. You know, if we can just restart the game and erase the first human's progress up until this point, how can it view itself as all-powerful? This is why it asks for our soul in return for recreating the world. It wants the power to save itself within the first human body no matter what. Much like how our friends were saved within Asriel during the pacifist fight. In order to keep its progress and maintain its power and control over the world, it needs to be able to come back. It can't become a god if it isn't separate from the entity that is the soul. Basically, the body only rebels against us because it was taught to rebel. Yes, the first human may have been a bad person during their life according to Azriel at the end there, but they weren't genocidal, they were just jerks. We taught the body to be genocidal. However, that doesn't mean in neutral and pacifist route the body is for some reason a different person either. It's just that they were taught a very different lesson from the time they woke up until the game's end from what they were taught in the genocide route. You see, the body is in every route the same flower vessel I suppose them to be, but remember what Flowey describes waking up to be like. They woke up with the 
the memories of Azrael in the King's Garden all of a sudden, unable to feel anything and completely confused. Only through trial and error and boredom did Flowey eventually become psychopathic. They taught themselves to be like the way they are now. But now look at the human body. It woke up confused with the idea that their plan failed and unsure as to the point of their revival with the memories of the first human. They say only with our guidance, in this case a horrible murder spree, did they understand the purpose of their reincarnation, power. But unlike Flowey, this vessel woke up with a soul in it, which means it immediately, upon revival in a confused semi-blank state, was moulded by us from the game's beginning. It instantly had to follow our orders as we gave it drive, because what else was it going to do? It gave us the ability to interact with the world of Undertale, and if we didn't take the genocide route, what did we teach the body to do in the neutral or pacifistic route? What lessons was this blank vessel taught? To be nice. Why would it rebel when it never learns to view itself as a separate entity from the soul or that being separate would benefit them in any way? You see, the first human, the body that we pilot of every route is the same body, the same human, just with different perspectives. This however brings up the obvious question. If the first human was a bad person in their original life and thus retained that identity during genocide, why is it that during pacifist does the body, during one of the only times it does something beyond our control, name itself Frisk? That's technically an act of rebellion towards the soul. Why would it do that and why the name Frisk? Is the body we pilot literally a different person depending on how we play the game? Well, like I said, I don't think so. I think it has something to do with what we taught it about life up until this point. Let's look at the reasons to rebel in the first place. To answer that, we'd have to take a look at the True Lab section, where we fight Snowdrake's mother. In this section, after acting peaceful and helpful throughout the entire game, we can actually now, as the soul, make the selection to be needlessly cruel. You can heckle or laugh at Snowdrake's mother, calling them horrible looking and questioning why they're alive, and basically laugh so hard at their misery you cry laughing. Until the message box says, what? You didn't say that. The text box, remember the inner monologue of the body and the body's way of relaying information to you, is stopping you from being cruel. Like the inverse of the genocidal version of the body that attacks without being ordered, this body doesn't want to hurt anyone. This goes for our actual attacks as well in the True Lab. If we try to attack the amalgams, they are unharmed by our attacks, but instead we get a bunch of red text stating phrases such as, nope, failure, but it didn't work, I'm loving it, absorbed, and don't worry about it. Now why are those phrases? I'm not sure. But we do know what red text indicates. It's the dialogue of the first human, aka the body. The body is refusing to hurt these monsters, and as such is rebelling. Instead, they're just spouting a bunch of phrases. So the reason to rebel in the first place seems to be attached to the body not wanting to cause any harm to any creature it comes across. That implies that the body of the first human we pilot knows that within our soul, we have the capacity to hurt as much as we have the capacity to help. But unlike genocide, it doesn't demand absolute power, but simply refuses to obey our commands. So as you can see, we never really have control over the body in both genocide and pacifist routes. The body always had the capacity to rebel against our orders, but because of the body's confusion as to its purpose of reincarnation, it blindly follows our orders until the end of the game, at which point in both genocide and pacifist, the body develops its own personality. Now obviously the routes we take don't create the same kind of rebellion against our soul. The body in genocide wants nothing but power and is its completely own separate person, unlike in pacifist where the body still works alongside us, the soul, but it gives itself its own name and refuses to hurt people. But then there's that question again, why did it give itself the name Frisk? So when we are talking to Flowey's Azrael form, a fellow humanoid flower child, the body says its name is not that of the cruel first human's name, the body gives itself a new name instead, Frisk. Now why Frisk? Well, if you were to think that you were the original human but no longer share their cruelty, what was the purpose of your reincarnation in pacifist route? I'd say it'd be atonement. Here's where it gets a bit wonky. Remember how Metaton's steak, the face steak that gets shortened to F steak in game if you give the first human a certain name? Well, I'm not saying that's a convention Toby uses all the time, but it does happen a lot with item names. Here's a list of items that do get shortened with the starting letter of the first word chopped off and added to the second word of the item. In a similar vein to that, Frisk 2 may be a mashed together name like that, and what words would have been used to make Frisk? Well the only two that I can think that matter here are Flower 
and the name Chris mixed around. I know what that implies, that this is somehow Chris from Deltarune, but how does that work here in Pacifist? Well, if it's true, then that means the name Chris isn't the true name of the first human, but instead a name the body wanted for itself if Chris in Deltarune is the same character as our character in Undertale. Now, why did it want the name Chris or any variation of that? I don't know. But being that in Genocide, the body decides to keep the name of the first human, but in Pacifist, it changes it to something more Chris-like, it implies that if Deltarune is somehow a sequel to Undertale, then Deltarune stems from a post-Pacifist world where the body named itself Frisk, but the world where that happened is a post-Pacifist world, in which a Genocide route was already completed, and the soul given to the body, aka the first human. And since the name of Chris is actually an anagram of Frisk, we must assume the body changed its name and dropped the F at the start, which may imply that the body has turned fully human or is no longer identifying as a flower and more like the first human. Maybe. I'm not sure. Honestly, I spent a majority of the time trying to make the name Frisk work, and I don't really know what to say about the Deltarune connection, especially since I've still yet to play the new chapters at the time of writing. But still, that's my best answer as to the reason why the body names itself Frisk in the first place. It is a flower, Chris, mixed together. Now, it's not impossible that Frisk is Chris and vice versa. As explained before, there's a possibility that it's a post-pacifist, post-genocide world out there. Maybe everyone has just forgotten who they are, and they are just their future selves acting with a misremembered fake past. Toby states on his Steam page that the story of Undertale is parallel to Deltarune, meaning both may be happening at the same time two different worlds that may interact with one another, like the Lightner and Darkner worlds do. And we know the term world is used a lot in Undertale, but worlds can be altered, changed, destroyed, revived, so when Toby tells us not to worry as these are different worlds with different rules, he can literally mean the same world just changed. I don't know when, but I'm sure the aliens are coming.